Hi everyone, I thought we'd do something different today and make a change in how we record this message. So here I am at my daughter Jodie's place and son-in-law Sam, and so I want to welcome you to come into their lovely home here because we're going to record actually sitting down at their uh, dining room table. So here we are coming through into the kitchen here. There's the dining room there. We're all set up to make a recording. But hey, as you come and you're going to notice in the background there, there is a Christmas tree. And hey, I'm always proud of anybody that has a Christmas tree. I had mine up since early October. So anyway, let's get into this message and trust you're going to enjoy it. Let's just pray, shall we? Father, we just thank you for this wonderful new year that you've given to us. Lord, your mercies are new every morning, well, every year as well. Holy Spirit, I just pray that as we share this first message from myself, Lord, across the campuses, Holy Spirit, that you'd speak to each and every one of us. Let us hear a word in season, a word that's going to impact us and help us as we passage our way through this coming year. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Firstly, can I just welcome everybody in? We're going across all campuses, Church Unlimited, Kaitaia, Whangarei, City, West as well, Rotorua, also Tuvalu and Sydney. Great to have you join me today. We are in for a huge year. The year we've already had, it's been a great year, a lot of expansion, growth. You know, New Zealand Beyond doubled twice again, up to about 3,000 people. But I believe this year will be even bigger. It's going to be a massive year. And one of the words we're going to have to come to terms with is a word not all of us like. And it's the word known or called change. I read this challenging statement not long ago by the president of the third most valuable company in the world. He said a key to continued success is to thrive on change. To thrive on change. He didn't even say accept change, be open to change. He went much further, thrive on change. However, Mark Twain said this, the only person who likes change is a wet baby. Isn't that the truth? I think our natural instinct, mine is, is to resist the winds of change that blow over our lives. Sometimes this wind will blow gently, other times it's going to come like a gale force wind. When there's a shift in heaven, there's a sift upon the earth. Think about that. When God wants to shift something in heaven over your life, move you into greater fruitfulness, effectiveness and blessing as a campus, as an individual, then there's going to be a sift upon the earth. In other words, God is going to do some things in our lives that adjust us, change us, sift us, that make us ready to handle the more God has for us. It's not comfortable, but God is always, always up to something really, really good. So let's pick up a scripture on that from Luke chapter 5, 37 to 39. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskin and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says, the old is better. So the great tendency is to think that the old was better. Often that's a fantasy. We make the good old days actually seem a lot better than they really were. God's always moving forward. He's always up to something new. And so to move forward, we have to embrace change. I know it's a challenge, but it's a reality. To move into the new, often you have to let go of the old. I've faced a lot of change, especially in the last three or four years as we've got more campuses, God's opened the doors for more national, international ministry. We've had a significant, huge increase in staff. I've had to let go some of the responsibilities I previously had, and it's all been quite challenging. But I've had to change in order to move myself forward in order for Church Unlimited and also the campuses to move forward. So we're all caught in this whole area of change. If you want God to shift heaven over your life then, and move into greater fruitfulness, then you have to embrace some change, some pruning, some shifting. Here's a quote for you by Stephen Hawking. You probably most of you have heard of him. He says this, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. 
Intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. I wonder which of our campuses is the most intelligent. Is it Kaitaia, Whangarei City? Call out if it's you. West, Rotorua, Sydney, or maybe even Tuvalu. The most intelligent is the one most capable of adjusting to and accepting change and thereby moving forward into a greater future. I read this book, Church Quake, and it speaks about powerful apostolic churches that are having huge impact in the area, the region, seeing lots of people saved, even affecting their nation. And one of the characteristics of these apostolic leaders is they are addicted to change. Think about that. Great leaders are addicted to change. They're constantly looking for new ways of doing things, but also they're willing to change themselves. Church Unlimited, as you know, is an apostolic church, and God is always making changes. We started off with one campus, as you know. There was rapid growth. We added the radio, then the television, then came the Running With Fire magazine, New Zealand Beyond in Auckland, New Zealand Beyond in Christchurch, Pakistan and beyond, second campus, then more campuses, United Kingdom beyond, change after change after change. And all of these required adjustment and sacrifice as well. Moving forward comes with that word change. The fact is, new vision energizes people, energizes a campus. Can't just keep doing the same old, same old, same old. People tire of it. God is the most creative person on the universe. And I think he's always wanting us to be creative and coming up with new thoughts, new ideas, and new ways of doing things. You can't run a bigger, faster train on old tracks. We've been saying that for some time, haven't we? So God's showing us new tracks so that every campus can become a bigger, faster train that's going to affect its community, the nation, and even the nations of the world. Campuses, can I encourage you to ask God for new tracks that will help you make a difference to where God has placed you. That's our challenge moving forward. Here's another quote for you. Progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. That was George Bernard Shaw. Here's the question for you. Can you change your mind, or are you so stubborn <laughs> that people say, to you, say about you, You'll never change his mind. You'll never change her mind. You really don't want to be like that unless it's a conviction uh, from scriptures or something uh, of, of a godly perspective on things. Throughout church history, I think we'd all know that one denomination after another has rejected or struggled with or not accepted uh, changes that God has brought with new moves of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the willingness to change as God moves is paramount. Not only have been people unwilling to change, but some of them have actually persecuted those bringing God-ordained changes. It's interesting that the extent of change and rate of change is accelerating alarmingly. Sociologists say change is happening faster than ever before. Our culture is actually reinventing itself every three to five years. They're having new patterns of behavior two or three times a decade. Think about that. So 20-year-olds struggle to understand 17-year-olds. And a 15-year-old is going to struggle to understand a 12-year-old because the rate of change is so rapid. Here's a good question for you. How well do you handle change? In fact, ask the person next to you. How well do you handle change? See what kind of response you might get. So there are early adopters. They get on board quickly. Then there's middle adopters, they have to think about it a bit, then they come on board. There's late adopters, they're slow to make a change. Then there are non-adopters. There's no way on the planet they are going to change and embrace something new and fresh that is happening. Wonder where you'd put yourself. An early adopter? Middle adopter? Late adopter, non-adopter. I'm not sure where I put myself. I don't think I'm an early adopter. Maybe middle, hopefully, middle to early. Not sure. You may have heard of this pastor objecting to new trends in music. This is what he said. He said, there's reasons for opposing it. It's all too new. It's often even worldly. Well, that's pretty bad, isn't it? New Christian music is not as pleasant. There's so many new songs, you can't learn them all. I often feel that myself sometimes, to be honest. 
It puts too much emphasis on instrumental music rather than godly lyrics. And it's a money-making scene. I'm sure a lot of us would agree with some of those comments. Do you know when that was said? 1723, 300 years ago, by a pastor attacking none other than Isaac Watts, who is now seen as the father of hymns. Here, clearly, we've got to embrace change. If we're going to move forward, there is no other way around it. So one of the things I found God does is he changes our circumstances to change us. So we love change. You all need to change this. The church needs to change that. Society needs to change here. God says, hey, forget about all that. Actually, you need to change. Tark, you need to change. Well, I never thought about that. Jeremiah 48, 11, Moab has been at ease from his youth. He has settled on his dregs and has not been emptied from vessel to vessel nor gone into captivity. Therefore, his taste remained in him and his scent was not changed. So without changes, Moab remained the same. His scent was unchanged. He was the same today or worse than five or 10 years ago. So Moab is pictured as wine in the making. And part of the process is pouring the wine from one jar to another so that the sediment that is settled on the bottom is left behind. But Moab was not poured from vessel to vessel and it had settled on its dregs and become like wine that had an awful taste. It was contaminated by the sediment at the bottom. So God sent Moab into captivity, poured her into another vessel to change her taste. So what God does, and this is my demonstration here with these beautiful church and limited cups, is God, this is your life, all right? So he pours you from one situation, one circumstance. There you go. You're getting poured into a whole new situation. And then you've settled in there and God does a work in your life there. And you think, man, this is cool. I'm just getting comfortable. Oh, this is so good. And God says, hello, time for more change because he wants you to grow more. He wants you to develop more. He wants to develop other qualities of character in your life. So you're into another vessel and you're thinking, wow, I'm just about like Jesus now. I must have arrived. God, I've been from vessel to vessel. God, you've changed my circumstances so many times now for a decade of rest. God says, well, I'd love to do that for you, Tark, but sorry, you need some more changes. There's a bit of sediment down there. There's a bit of scent in you that's not quite the flavor I want. There's some attitudes in your life, some aspects of character a bit lacking, uh, some faith that's not as strong as, but here we go again. You're going to get poured into a, another vessel. And there you go. And then, you, then God does more work in your life. And I could go on all day and think, OK, let's go back again. It's going to be another vessel. And then God's just going to keep pouring you and pouring you from vessel to vessel to vessel. You see, God has to do that in order to change us and make us into the people that he wants us to be so we don't become distasteful like Moab. Israel is an example of this. Israel was... Lost in idolatry. Had repeated warnings, get rid of your idolatry. But she refused to. So what did the prophets warned her? So what did God do? He poured them into a new vessel. They went into captivity in Babylon, into a whole different nation. So while they're in Babylon, somewhere along the Babylon's a very idolatrous nation. So somewhere in captivity they were changed. They got rid of the idolatry by overdose. God overdosed them on it. And to this day, would you believe Israelis remain free of idolatry? Israel was changed. How? By being poured into another vessel. That's how God changes our lives. That's how God prepares us for the greater future he's got in store for our lives. This is clearly seen in the life of Joseph. Have you ever wondered why Joseph, you know, he goes into that pit, then he goes into the prison, He's accused by Potiphar's wife. You know, it's just, he's poured from vessel to vessel to vessel. And it must have been so difficult. And some of it looked like demotions. He was up at a certain rank and then next thing he's in prison. Some of the changes that we face will look like demotions. They're going to look like backward steps. You're going to think, man, I thought I was just going forward. And now it's kind of turned to cuss. I've gone backwards. And I've experienced this myself. Still am at times. I think, gosh, God, that feels like a demotion. That feels like going backwards. The problem is we only see with our natural eyes. I often love saying we can see to the corner. 
God can see around the corner. God knows what he is doing. And that's what happened to Joseph. He went from one painful and confusing captivity to another. You see, there was a shift in heaven and God was preparing his man for something new. So there had to come a sift on earth. God had to work in his life to get him ready for a more fruitful and effective life and ministry. That's how God prepares us. I think back to decades ago, Adrian and I were poured into a new vessel. I mean, this was a dramatic pouring into it. Like it was like huge, we're just poor boy, right into a whole new vessel. See, I was working as an accountant, Adrian as a nurse. We had to pack our bags and God sent us off into the vessel known as the Philippines. We had well-paying jobs. And so this was a astronomical change. Missionaries for a start, new job, away from family, into a new home, climate change. We traveled to remote villages, honestly, living in huts. We traveled on boats, we'd sleep on the top deck on stretches, third class. And, um, you know, it was, it was a challenging time. But guess what? God was doing a work in our lives. And I believe preparing us for what we are doing with our lives today. But we had to go through the Philippines, I believe, as difficult as it was, because there were some things God needed to do in our lives, maybe some sediment that would settle in our lives, the scent of which was not pleasing to God. And not that he dealt with everything in the Philippines, but it was a necessary part of our promotion. But like when Joseph went through some of his challenging times, we had to go through some of our challenging times. But the big challenge, many ways, was the change, the dramatic change from New Zealand to a whole new nation, one set of friends and family to a whole new set of people that we had to get on with. So, but that's the way it works. That's the way God prepares us. There was a shift in heaven, so God had to sift us upon the earth. I heard this not long ago. Just throw it out for good measure. Never lose your spirit of adventure. Never lose it. It's too easy to lose it. Settle down, so like get on the lazy boy and waste your life away. Allow adventure to stay, especially as the years go by. Adventure is like embracing change, tackling something new. We've talked a lot about getting out of your comfort zone. All these are keys to growing as a person. But more than that, they're all keys to becoming everything God has called you to be, that awesome and amazing person. Locked in you is some incredible gifts, abilities, and things you can accomplish. But guess what? It's going to take change. It's going to take getting out of your comfort zone. It's going to take being poured from vessel to vessel. We need to get out of our comfort zone like Peter. When he got out of that boat, which was the most incredible thing he did, but guess what? He walked on water. And God wants all of us spiritually to walk on water, experience things that we never dreamed we'd experience. I think Church Unlimited is in that zone already. I think I'm in that zone already, experiencing things I never thought I would experience, getting out of that comfort zone. You know, shifting to the trust arena, that was getting out of the comfort zone. I could have thought, what if we fail? But oh, what if we fly? And I think we did fly. But it took a major step of getting out of the comfort zone, but also of changing. But then the ability to walk on water. Here's another quote for you by Frederick Douglass. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. If there's no struggle, there's no progress. Are you struggling today? Battling with something? Challenged by something? Hey, guess what? It's actually the key to progress. If you embrace it, respond to it, don't react to it, don't resist it, don't fight it. Embrace it and see what God will do in your life. You won't like my next point because I don't like it either. Maybe I should just skip it. Well, actually, it's in the Bible, so hey, I think I better give it to you. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Don't you hate that verse? God brings people into our lives to change us. Some of them make us better, but some of them, they all make us better, but often they're just sharpening us. He uses people to make us into the people he wants us to be. So we need to allow others to stretch us, to change us. Think of the people in your life today. <laughs> you probably don't want to think of some of them. Your kids, your parents, 
co-workers, your husband, wife, boss, pastor, heaven sent. I think God arranges our lives, don't they? I'm heaven sent to you. I know some of you are not sure about that, but there you go. It is what it is. How are we going to cope with change? I wish I knew, but let me give you some thoughts and some ideas. To make us more fruitful, God stretches and expands us. A bit like this rubber band here. This is you. So, you know, that's comfortable there, isn't it? But you want to grow? You want to be more fruitful? You want to shift in heaven over your life? God's going to stretch you, man. He's going to pull you out. And I tell you, stretching is not that easy. You know, it, it can get quite tight. You know, you actually sometimes you can think, man, I'm going to break. But God is stretching us. And, you know, it's, it's dangerous if we try and stay the same. You know, hold on to our form. We just become rigid. And if we, you know, the more rigid you are, the more chance you're going to break. See, something that's elastic, and it's hard to break something that's really elastic and adjustable and changeable. But if this was a stick and I wanted to mold it, sometimes you actually have to break it. Don't become stiff. Don't be stiff-necked. In fact, why don't you just ask the person next to you, are, are you stiff-necked? That might get a bit of reaction. If it gets a reaction, they're probably guilty. All right, so coping with change. Here's one of the things I think is really important, and that is an attitude of trust. You trust God that he actually knows what he's doing with your life, no matter what the change is, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how painful it is. Just that trusting that God is in that situation because when we choose to trust God, it draws down great grace into our lives. What is grace? Grace is a supernatural ability to cope with anything we may be facing. How do you get that supernatural ability to cope with something that's actually beyond you to cope with? You get it through trust. It draws down the power of God into our hearts and our lives. I've experienced this at times. When I've faced really difficult situations, I've just said, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. I don't understand it. I don't like it. I hate it, but I trust you. And I have found that great grace has come into my heart. And then I thought to myself, gosh, how am I handling this? How come I feel a peace and an ease about it? Trust. I think trust is more powerful than we realize. In fact, they say the middle verse of the Bible is that it's better to trust in the Lord than to put our trust in man. The middle verse. So the core of Christianity our walk with God, I think, is that simple word, trust. Can I encourage you, whatever you're facing today, trust God. Trust that he knows what he's doing. Trust that he'll get you through. Trust that you're going to come out to a better place. Trust that you're going to be more effective and more fruitful moving forward. God knows what he's doing, even if we don't know what's going on. I think I've learned to trust God and trust the Holy Spirit more and more with my life with Church Unlimited, and all the future that God has in store for us. It helps me a lot to handle the changes, to accept changes, to handle the expansion that God has for us. If you can give thanks in the midst of change, giving thanks, I think you'll find grace and you'll find strength. Joseph had a faith that he could see God in everything, the good and the bad. That's an incredible high level of faith, I believe. We read it in Genesis 20, 20. Sorry, we read it in Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Joseph was able to embrace change. He was willing to be sifted on the earth so he could enjoy the shift in heaven over his life. The truth is God is always preparing us for greater fruitfulness. Always, always, always. That's his plan because there's more to your life than what is seen at present. There's more in you that people are, more in you that people are yet to see and God's working in our lives to get us ready for it. Unfortunately, it requires change. Here's another way of coping with change, I think, and that is letting go. And man, this can be so hard. We never like to let anything go. We, we, we're a consumer generation, hold on, hold on, hold on. And God is saying, no, let go, let go, let go. 
And uh, it's a challenge to do that. But you have to let go of something to make room for something new. See, if, we, if you, your two hands, if you keep holding on to everything, there's only so much your hands can hold. It's the same with your life. So you've got to let some things go in order to embrace something fresh, something new, something that's going to help you go forward with your life. With changes, some of them will be losses. And I mentioned this a little bit before. And they can be hard to take. And grief is a God-given process to help us to come to terms with our losses. And we need time to adjust emotionally. It is not easy. I have faced some unexpected losses and they've not been easy to process. But I realize this. It's a bit like a fresh revelation for me. Is that just as additions are from God, so are losses in most cases. I guess you can't be too blanket on it, but I think in most cases that's the case. Plus, if you add to that, God has a better plan. Some doors have shut for me for better ones to open. Some doors have to shut for better ones to open. We can easily resist a change that is actually a key to progressing to better things. Another thing that may help you, one step at a time. One step at a time. Don't look too far ahead. It can be overwhelming. A lady who lost her husband. Now that's a huge loss and that's a massive change. She said she lived one day at a time. There was no five-year plan. There was no one-year plan. Just a plan for each day. That's how she got through. Matthew 6.34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Easier said than done. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Well, that's true enough, isn't it? There's enough things to get through today, let alone worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow or the following week. God gives us grace for one day at a time. His mercies are new every morning. There's no mercy today to handle tomorrow. So, hey, stick to handling just today. Focus on one day and you won't be overwhelmed. Mile by mile, it's a trial. Yard by yard, it's so hard. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. Well, campuses, we're moving into a, another year and we will all face changes. Some small changes, some medium level changes, some huge changes. Some of them will be challenging. We need to learn to embrace change and to thrive on change because it's God's ordained pathway to greater fruitfulness and blessing. Greater days are ahead for all of us. I pray and I trust that you have a wonderful, wonderful year. Thank you so much for joining me today and may God bless you.